My name is Claire Wild. I want to welcome everyone to our event with Richard Wolf. He's speaking on Occupying Our Future, Cooperative Solutions to Tough Times. Richard Wolf is Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he taught economics for, from 1973 to 2008. He's currently a visiting professor in the graduate program in international affairs of the New School University, New York City. His latest book, and I understand there are more to come, is Capitalism Hits the Fan, The Global Economic Meltdown and What to Do About It. Here's the book. They have it at Book Passage or you can order it from one of the other local bookstores. We have note cards available for questions after the talk. And again, it's great to see everybody here. And let's welcome Richard Wolf. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for inviting me. I hope my notes here don't blow away. <laughs> And I hope that I can make uh, some of what's happening a bit more understandable. First of all, something I need to do, which I do with all the Occupy groups that I talk to, which is on behalf of an enormous number of American people, to thank you for making this movement happen, for staying with it, not only before the media decided you were real, but after the media found a group of strange Republicans running for office to be more interesting than you are. That will pass, as most of them will, but this Occupy movement is a genie that has emerged from a bottle and no one can put that back. And uh, I can assure you that the movement around the country of this is as impressive now after the media attention has faded as it was uh, before. Uh, the forms are changing. A new movement that could do what this one did, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, will of course lead the authorities who have no way of dealing with the issues that brought Occupy into existence to do the only thing they can do since they cannot change those conditions or have no interest in doing it. They can only try one way or another to repress. The same leaders who celebrate democracy movements in other countries have such a terrible time when the chickens come home to roost and it happens in their own country. In New York City where I live and where I spent a good bit of time down at Zuccotti Park where a lot of this started, uh, we have the following spectacle just to give you an idea of how absurd it can be. We have a very uh, zero kind of fellow as mayor, a man whose only claim to fame is that he's very wealthy, which is as you know a major way to become a politician in the United States now. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, confronted with a movement that grew by leaps and bounds in a matter of weeks, he could do no better than to destroy it. And he destroyed it in an interesting way. First, he explained to the world, he couldn't do better than the following, that the park isn't clean enough where the young people had gathered, and the people of all ages in fact, it wasn't clean enough and so he had to clear the park. This is the mayor who presides over the filthiest subway system on earth, who has done nothing in his time as mayor to do anything about that. It's a city that has a system of disposing of garbage, myself included, as follows. You take it, you put it in a bag, and you throw it on the sidewalk. And during the night, the large number of creatures that inhabit our city come out and open up the garbage and distribute it in a very democratic way all over the street. Uh, this is a mayor who obviously could care less about cleanliness, but in that park, it was really important to be clean. It destroyed a good part of that man's reputation. He didn't have much of one, but the little bit he had, that was destroyed. The other part of that action, which was counterproductive, was the wonderful scene played on the televisions of New York of the bulldozers that came in and destroyed the little public library that the uh, folks in that park had established. A collection of plastic containers with books that had been contributed and that were lent out and there was a little record-keeping procedure. 
In the same week that Mayor Bloomberg destroyed the library created by Occupy, he announced the, necess the necessity, as he sees it, to reduce the number of hours that the city's public libraries are open. So he destroyed the public library created by the people in order to do what? To achieve the cleanliness he can't manage to do anywhere else. A man like that gets exactly what he deserves, which is a real major de destruction of his uh, reputation. And I'm very proud, uh, since I have a radio program in New York City uh, once a week for an hour, that I'm doing everything I can to help in that destruction of his uh, reputation. All that's left really for him is to be a Republican running around explaining to people that he's not as bad as all the other Republicans, which in New York City is an effective way of, of moving forward. But the problem in New York City is there hardly aren't any Republicans, and so it's very hard. He's talking to a very small number of people. All right, let me turn to what I came here to talk to you about, which is the economic crisis, what is happening, how it is working itself out, and perhaps what you most care about is where it's going and what it's going to mean. Okay, let's begin. We are now in the fifth year of this economic crisis. This downturn begins in the middle of 2007. And it is important that everyone understands it has never been fixed. We now have an unemployment rate in the United States in the neighborhood of 8.5 to 9%. We've had that for the last three years. No appreciable change. The number of people that are unemployed in this country at this time is in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 million officially. If you add the people who have a part-time job but don't want it, they want a full-time job. And those who no longer are looking for work, a wonderful category that the Bureau of Labor Statistics in Washington calls discouraged workers. Wonderful choice. Sometimes they're also called marginal workers. That's the official category. You put them all together, it's about 15 to 15 and a half percent of the labor force in this country. 20 to 25 million people. And nothing has been done, fundamentally nothing, for them. In 2011, we had more for, uh, home foreclosures in the United States than we'd had in any year prior to that. Nothing effectively is being done to deal with that problem either. The length of time an average unemployed person is unemployed is longer than it's been in the recorded history of that statistic, which is 50 years old. For the mass of people, this economic crisis continues. Even more important, if you look at something that economists call the real wage, that's the amount of money you get adjusted for the prices you have to pay with that money that you earn. The real wage over the last 12 months dropped another 2% in the United States, having dropped for a long time. When the real wage, what you actually get for your income, keeps dropping, then the gap between the rich and the poor keeps widening. That gap, which has been widening in the United States for 35 years, uninterruptedly, and which is a large part of why we have an economic crisis. When you read in the paper, the stores are not selling enough, the goods are not selling enough, there's not enough demand, that's an indirect way of saying for the mass of people, their purchasing power keeps being shrunken. And the result is, if you do that, then the businesses have no customers the way they did, and the whole thing grinds on at a low-key level, and that's where our economic system uh, sits. And nothing has been done. And I'm going to come back to that. Nothing has been done. But it's always important in an economic system like ours to look not only at what's happening to the mass of people, but to look at the other side of the coin, something which you, your movement, has taught the American people to think like this in a way that has been difficult for generations. You've made it clear that a way to look at this country is to distinguish the 99% from the 1%. That cuts through a great deal of nonsense and focuses people in a way that makes my job as a teacher and as a speaker much, much easier. So let's look at the other side of the equation, the 1%. If you take that group of people, here's the reality. Not only have they recovered from the crisis which affected them also in 2008 and 2009, but their position is relatively stronger now than it even was at the beginning of the downturn in 2007. 
You can see that from the pay packages that top executives in most American corporations are now able to give themselves. You can see it in the revival of the stock market, not all the way, but for most of what it lost, it has gotten that back. Those people who depend on the stock market, and a little statistics always never to, to forget, 1% of the shareholders in this country own 75% of the shares. So when you hear that the stock market is going up, please do not think about the 11 shares of General Motors your grandmother may have left you. That's not what's significant. What's significant is that the people who get, own the bulk of the shares are the ones who make the benefit that is provided by a government that throws this much money in. Two and a half years ago, led by Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont and a few others, a demand was made, a demand was made on the Federal Reserve to reveal to the American people, it is after all an institution set up by the laws of the United States, how much money they had given to what banks in the dark days of 2008, 9, and 10, and actually even unto the, right to this present. And the Federal Reserve, fearful of what the American people would think if they told them, refused. And they refused repeatedly. And they were able to prevent anyone from getting that information. Uh, Mr. Obama did nothing to, re to release that information as he could have forced them to do, and so on. It took an interesting institution, the Bloomberg Financial News Service, to go to court to force the Federal Reserve to reveal what it had done. And here's what the Federal Re Reserve revealed a few weeks ago. This is very recent. That they had dumped, by their calculation, one and a half trillion dollars. It's 1.5 trillion. The Bloomberg didn't like the way they had done the calculation. By Bloomberg's calculation, it was 7.7 .7 trillion. And there are others who have made different calculations where it gets into the 20 trillion. The amount doesn't matter. Here's the reality. Most of the major banks of the United States, and not a few of its major insurance companies, have basically been on the government's dole for years. We do not have a private banking system. We have a banking system that has been sustained through its worst crisis by an endlessly renewed series of multi-billion dollar loans at very, very low interest rates for years. You couldn't help the people who were losing their homes because that seemed to be just too difficult and too complicated. But you were able to provide assistance to all the largest banks in the United States, and you still do. There are so many things I could tell you to give you this impression, but I'll pick just one to get this message across. Over the last two and a half years, just to get a sense of the government's bankrolling everything. 90% of all mortgages written in the United States, for anybody, 90% are either currently owned by the United States government or guaranteed by the United States government. In the absence of the government of the United States guaranteeing or buying all the mortgages, and to make it clear to all of you, you may have a mortgage in which you send a monthly payment to the local bank. The bank is what's called a servicer. The bank doesn't own that anymore. The bank just turns that money around and gives it to the owner. And right now, the major order in the United States of mortgages is the United States government. Without the government either guaranteeing or buying every mortgage, your local bank wouldn't give you one. And if the local banks did not give people the wherewithal to buy housing in this country, there would be no housing market. And to make sure you understand what I'm saying, if the government didn't do that, if you owned a house, it would be worth half today of whatever it is worth because there'd be no buyers for it. There is no way to sustain. The American economy is a basket case dependent on the government's support at every major turn. Only the way the government is doing is giving the money at the top. And then the idea is that everybody will slowly benefit if the folks at the top get theirs. This has a name. It comes from the Great Depression of the 1930s. This is called trickle-down economics. You take care of those at the top, 
and then you hope for it all to trickle down. Rarely does it trickle very far, and very rarely does it trickle for very long. Those at the top collect what they can, and if you are, get a few crumbs off the table, or if there's a byproduct, like in the case of the housing market, then you can get some benefit too. But as my statistics at the beginning showed you, for the mass of the American people, not much in the way of benefits. Less visible, something else. Even those people who have jobs, the quality of the jobs is changing, and the pay is changing, and the benefits that go with working are all changing, and they're all changing in the same direction, down. Down, down, down. Perhaps the most dramatic example is something called the two-tier labor contract. In those places where working people still have a union and still have a contract, more and more unions are signing a contract that works like this. For those workers that are working right now in this factory, in this office, in this store, we will continue to pay you the wages we've been paying you. But on one condition, that you permit us to pay those workers who replace you when you leave, you die, you retire, with another worker doing exactly the same thing to whom we will pay half of what we pay you. In the automobile industry in the United States, the going wage is about $28 an hour. Under the contract signed by the UAW, new hired workers can be hired at $14 an hour, and they are being hired in a range of $14 to $18 an hour. To get an idea of what that means, I want to invite you to take a trip, if you've never done it, sometime in the next year, and go to the city of Detroit. If you wish to see what the other side of capitalism is, go to Detroit, spend a day or two, you will not believe and I cannot describe, I lack the words, what that society has become, what that city has become. Block after block of burnt out houses. It's a, it's a landscape that people would otherwise associate with a bombed out Beirut or something of that, on that scale. But it's here in the United States. And in other parts of the United States, like Cleveland and other cities, you get replica of this. Very, very dangerous development. Nothing is happening. In Detroit, there's actually a, a takeover underway in which the government of the state of Michigan is going to take over the city of Detroit because they have to cut all the services and the local politicians can't do it, so the governor is going to do it for them. The fact that the local government in Detroit is democratic and African American and that the governor is white and Republican will give you one idea of what's coming down the pike in that part of the United States and those will be big headlines. If I had time I would talk to you about other parts of the destruction of this uh, economic crisis and all of its costs. I don't have the time but a couple of hints to you before we get on with the business of today. To, to the south of us is a country that cannot function as a country anymore. It's called Mexico. Mexico is, among other things, a victim of this economic crisis in a way you need to understand because in the highest levels of the United States government, there's something just shy of panic about what's going on in that quote unquote, and I'm quoting from White House conversations, the failed state. That's the way this is referred to. Mexico lived for the last 10 years on a kind of borrowed time. Because of the NAFTA agreements, the Mexican economy being now open to the United States and vice versa, experienced the arrival of American corporations, one of whom was Walmart. And what Walmart did, to make a complex story simple, was to arrive in Mexico and to create department stores of the Walmart type which completely outcompeted and destroyed thousands, millions of small shopkeepers in every Mexican village who handled the rice and the beans and the cloth and the pots and pans, the usual materials for people to live. They were destroyed. Likewise, all kinds of crops from the United States that they couldn't compete with and so on. The result was for millions of Mexicans, they had a choice over the last 20 years, 15 years, depending on how you count, 
They could stay in Mexico where there was neither work, nor future, nor economic survival, or they could go someplace else, and you all know better than we do in the East, where they went. And they came here because there was no way to survive where they were. This solved two problems for Mexico. One, the inability to provide work for millions and millions of their own citizens without a revolutionary change at home. That was a big solution for them. Second, those workers who came to the United States sent back to Mexico huge amount of money. It's called remittances, huge amounts. In Mexico, it was the second or third largest export. That is, it brought in more money than almost anything else Mexico has to sell. They got rid of the people for whom they had no work and no life. And they acquired a vast new inflow of money. Best of all possible worlds. Starting in 2007, the thing that went up started coming down. The, work, the workers stopped coming from Mexico. There was no point. There's no work here. They stopped coming and they started returning. And because there was no work here, and particularly in the housing industry where so many Mexican immigrants were employed across the country, they also had nothing to send back anymore. So they went home, which Mexico can't handle, and the money stopped flowing. The next time you read about pitched battles between police and drug gangs with the ability to identify who's in which side being it very, very difficult, you know, given the overlap, uh, even more than in our society. Uh, the uh, problem is a, not a problem of drugs. That's the symptom. The underlying problem is there is no Mexican economy that can survive. You have enclaves that the government is protecting, and the rest is a free zone. That's a casualty of this economic crisis. Nothing is happening to deal with that problem at all. It just sits and gets worse until it blows up. This is a society that can no longer, in our country, handle its problems. And the Occupy movement is itself another symptom of that. If I can interrupt for a minute and just tell you something personally, here I am, a critic of the American economic system. In case any of you don't know this, I'm going to let you on a secret. I don't like capitalism. <laughs> and I never have. I don't, I'm a professional economist. I've been a professor of economics all my life. And I don't mind telling you, because I enjoy the humor of it, that I'm not only an economist by profession, but I'm a product of the American university system, of the very uh, fanciest of them. I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. And when I graduated, I came out here. I went to school at Stanford for a year, and I got a degree there. And when uh, I finished there, I went back east, and I finished my education at Yale. See, by American standards, I'm a poster boy for the American elite education. And I think capitalism is a disaster. And I learned that from the people who have been distressed ever since, that something about their education ended up in such a form. But here's the reason I tell you this. I've been therefore critical of this system and how it works with its results most of my adult life. But in the last two years, something dramatically changed. I have done more public speaking and appeared on more radio and television programs in the last two years than in the previous 40 of my life. It's very important that you understand that. I cannot do that is, I cannot meet the invitations I now get. I turn down more invitations now than I ever received in the past. That's how serious this is. And not only is it different, and not only has it really mushroomed since the Occupy movement, but the quality of these interviews that I have is different. I was telling some of the folks who invited me a few minutes before I got here, here's the way it used to be. I would come occasionally onto some radio or television program, and the interviewer, the announcer, the host, would begin by saying, hello, ladies and gentlemen, today I have, pregnant pause, one of those. And then they would proceed to describe me in a way that would make my mother nervous. 
And as soon as they were finished with this description of the very strange person they had invited, the next step in the interview saw the host patting himself or herself on the back for having the enormously broad-minded openness to have one of them on the program. You know, if you're introduced that way, it's, all, it's over almost before you begin. What's left to be said? All that has changed. Now I'm on the radio and the television, and I'm Professor Wolf. I should tell you, I was Professor Wolf last year, too. And 10 years ago, I was, that's all I've ever done, has been a professor of economics, basically. But now I'm the professor, and now I have something interesting to say, and now we have, it's a complete new world. It took me a while to understand that I wasn't in the combative place I had become used to. There's a lot of talk in the United States about the tea parties and the movement to the right. What there isn't so much recognition of, but what my life is proof of, is that there's been a sea change on the left, opening spaces for people like us to talk, to have an audience that is qualitatively unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime. And I was born in Youngstown, Ohio, if any of you know about that place. Uh, I've lived all my life in the United States, and this is a whole new world for me. And you should take some comfort, I think, from that. Okay, so let's go back. I described to you an economic crisis in full rush ahead, in which the mass of people continues to suffer under a set of circumstances that are very severe and that are not changing, while the rich are in fact literally getting richer relative to the rest of us with each week or month's statistics. Keep all that in mind when we take a small historical detour. I want to contrast for you what's happening now, or rather what isn't happening now, with what did once happen the last time the United States found itself in an economic crisis on this scale. That's the 1930s. A great crisis begins in October of 1929. Over the first three or four years, from 29 to 1933-34, the situation gets worse and worse and worse. Massive unemployment massive suffering. But then something happens in 1933 and 4 that radically alters everything. And that's what we need to think about. First, something happened which didn't radically alter much. The election of a very centrist Democrat, sort of like an Obama, except of course he wasn't black, uh, Franklin Roosevelt came in on a balanced budget program, the last thing on earth that was needed. And he becomes the president. That wasn't the important event. Here was the important event. Three institutions had begun to mobilize already earlier, but they really took off in the Great Depression. The first was a union organizing drive, bigger and more successful than any union organizing drive that had ever happened in American history before or that has ever happened since. It was called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, for those of you who know about the AFL-CIO. The CIO part took off, and it organized tens of millions of Americans in a matter of months. Amazing, powerful, the basic industries, chemicals, automobiles, electric workers, and so on. The second thing some of you that are older will know this from your memories, was that we had strong, growing, vibrant, and powerful socialist and communist parties in the United States. And they mobilized, and they had large numbers of members. And in case you're wondering, yes, there was a quite a bit of overlap between the CIO, the socialists, and the communists, all kinds. And they were a powerful group and they basically went to the government and they said, this is a capitalism that isn't working for the mass of people, and we are going to fight. You better do something. And if you don't, we're going to stop this society from functioning until you do. And they meant it. And the government knew that they meant it. This gave the new president a choice to make. Are you going to try to repress this? when it's big and powerful and on a scale that the country had never seen before, a real movement? Or 
are you going to try to work out a deal? And for better or worse, Roosevelt made the latter decision. He cut a deal. And here's how the deal went. I will give you, talking to the unions and the socialists and the communists, he met with them, by the way, I will give you a tremendous boost. I'm going to legalize you. I'm going to make you legitimate in the United States, and I'm going to give the masses of people enormous help in this crisis. And I'm going to give you the credit for having gotten that. In exchange, don't mess with capitalism. Leave it alone. I'll take care of you. What did Roosevelt mean by this? And here's the lesson for us now. What Roosevelt meant was, I'm going to find the money. Let me remind you, today you hear there's not enough money for this, there's not enough money for that. Uh, San Rafael can't have enough money, and San Francisco doesn't have enough money, and Obama doesn't have enough money, we can't do this, we have to cut back that. The Great Depression, the unemployment was 25% in 1933. That's two and a half times what it is now. So they had a much more severe problem of no money. What did the new president, when he cut a deal, what did he provide for the mass of people? He found the money. And I'm going to tell you in a few minutes just how he did it. But first, I want you to, to, you to see what he did. Number one, he created, in the midst of the Great Depression, the social security system. We didn't have that before. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand about when they knew the social security system started. This is not a history class. But just in case, it started in the middle of the 30s. Suddenly, in a Great Depression, when there's no money, the president announces that if you're 65 years of age or older and have done a lifetime of work, the government's now going to give you money forever until you die. What? There's no money. Yes, there is. We're going to take care of the old people. And we're going to say to all the young people, you don't have to take care of your older relatives the way you thought you would have to with no money because it's an unemployment situation. We'll do it. Wow. That was only the beginning. Next, he said, I'm going to create for the first time in American history an unemployment insurance program. We didn't have that before in this country either. If you're unemployed, which millions of Americans were, I'm, I got news for you. I'm going to give you money. Lots of it. Every week for doing nothing just because you're unemployed. What? What? Yes. But those were the small programs. Here comes the big one. In 1934, Roosevelt goes on the radio, and he says just about these words. If the private economic system, if private enterprises either cannot or will not give jobs to millions of Americans who want to work and are capable to work, then there's no alternative but for the government to give the work to the... Whoops. No censorship, no censorship. No censorship. This is my own mistake. At least not yet. We'll see. Maybe as the talk wears on, get better. So Roosevelt says, if the private sector cannot, then the public sector must. Between 1934 and 1941, Roosevelt created and filled 12 million federal jobs. He found the money to pay all those people a living salary. Let's see. There was no money in the Great Depression. And with no money in the middle of the 1930s, he created Social Security, unemployment insurance, and he hired 12 million people. Where did the money come from? Here comes the other part of the deal. Roosevelt went to the wealthy, the business leaders of America. And after all, the Roosevelt family was part of that. He came from those people. And he said to them, uh, I have to take care of the mass of people because if I don't, the system is over. If you don't deal with me, down the road are those unions and socialists and communists, and they're going to cut you a much worse deal. So I suggest you give me the money to produce for the mass of people to keep the lid on this explosive situation. And he split the business community and the wealthy right down the middle. Half of them bought his argument. The other half of them, and don't forget that other half, we're going to come back to them, they never did. They didn't like Roosevelt. They fought him every step of the way. But half of them went along. 
And so here's what Roosevelt did. He taxed them big time. He taxed the rich people and he taxed the corporations and he used the money for all the things I just described. And the unions and the socialists and the communists gave him what he wanted. They thanked him. They celebrated him as the great savior, literally in that kind of language. They didn't question the capitalist system anymore. Even those who called themselves communists didn't do that. He was the great victor, the great leader. And in case you're interested in politics, Roosevelt's deal, splitting the rich, making them pay, and creating massive programs to help the people, made Franklin Roosevelt the most successful president the United States has ever had, re-elected four times. The only reason there's a law on the books now that limits presidents to two sessions is the Republicans were so freaked out by Roosevelt that they got a law passed so that nobody could do that again. But the next time you hear someone tell you it's politically not a good idea to try to push a program to help the average person, remind them a little bit of our own history as a nation. That was the ticket to a successful president in a way nothing Mr. Obama has yet done could come close to. One would have to wonder why Mr. Obama doesn't try that if he's worried about next year. What were the rich required to pay? Again, I don't have all the time, but a couple of the numbers may blow your mind if you're not familiar with it. Under Roosevelt, Taxes on rich people were raised. How high? In the 1940s and 50s, the following. The richest taxpayers in America, the richest individuals, had to pay on every dollar roughly over 75000 the top bracket if you got that much, and that was a lot more then than it would be now, obviously. The top rate, 91%. Let me explain what that means. For every dollar over 75000 you earned, you sent Uncle Sam 91 cents, you kept nine. That was the tax rate not only put through by Roosevelt with the Congress's approval, but it was endorsed and kept in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s by Republicans and Democratic presidents alike and by Republican and Democratic Congresses alike. Taxing rich people at a high rate, being un-American, you don't know your history. It's as American as apple pie and baseball. Better, taxes on corporations in 1945, for every dollar raised by the federal government in taxing individuals, it got a dollar fifty in taxing corporations. 50% more of the government's revenue came from taxing corporations than individuals. What is the relationship today? For every dollar the federal government gets from individuals today, it gets from business 25 cents. That's the reality. And what's the top income bracket on the richest people? Is it the 91% of the 50s and 60s? No, it's 35%. Those are the tax cuts of the last 50 years. Removing the burden of taxation on corporations and shifting it to individuals, step one. Step two, removing the burden of taxation from the richest individuals and putting it instead on all of you. So on behalf of America's corporations and its rich, I want to say to all of you, thank you. <laughs> you have been very kind. But of course the reality is different. And here comes the punchline for today's talk. That part of the business community that didn't like the deal that Roosevelt had struck, didn't want to be taxed, didn't want to pay taxes, neither as corporations nor as individuals. They said, okay, Roosevelt got this one, but as soon as this depression is over, as soon as the war, which is what finally ended it, is over, we're gonna fight to get rid of everything that was done by Roosevelt. We don't like that kind of capitalism. We won't tolerate it. And here's what they did in the last 40 to 50 years. They used their position as the leaders of America's corporations. 
They used their position as the boards of directors of the corporations gathering into their hands the profits of all enterprises. They used that money and those positions to undo everything Roosevelt did. That's why the tax rates are 35% today for the top, not 91%. That's why corporations have basically gotten out of paying much in the way of income taxes. Some of you notice that every year there's a little story in the press once or twice telling us about how GE or GM paid no taxes at all last year, given the various loopholes and other things, that they had the money to write into the law over the last 50 years. Even the efforts of the Roosevelt government to regulate the American business community were undone. The most famous example in the depths of the depression when banks had gone completely belly up just like they did this time. The government passed a law, Banking Act of 1933, sometimes referred to by the name Glass-Steagall because of the name of the two legislators who pushed it through Congress. All it did was say that any bank that accepts deposits, the sort that you and I put in, cannot take inordinate risks with them. They can't invest that money long term because that risks them being unable to give you back the deposits you put in there. Or in the language of economics, they separated depository banking from investment banking. Those banks went right to work as soon as that law was passed to undo it. And they worked. It took a while. People had a memory of the Great Depression. They didn't trust banks too well. So it, they had to take a lot of time. They had to buy a lot of politicians. But being corporate presidents and heads of big banks, they had the resources to buy the politicians. And so by 1990, it was possible to pass a law undoing the Glass-Steagall Act. And in 1999, then-President Bill Clinton signed the bill that undid the separation of investment banking and deposit banking. And eight years later, the banking system collapsed again. What is the lesson of all of this? Two, two lessons that I want to drive home because they point to what we as a movement need to do. First, Regulating an economy, trying to use one or another regulation to deal with these crises, doesn't work. We have just been through a phase of our history in which the regulations that were passed were systematically undone. And in case you don't keep up, it's not just that the tax on corporations has dropped. It's not just that the tax on the rich has dropped. It's not just that the banking laws were changed again to allow the same abuse again that produced another crisis again. They are now tampering with something no one thought for the last 50 years they could tamper with, Social Security. It'll likely be this coming year, or if not then, for sure the next one, that are the age at which people can become eligible for Social Security will be raised in the United States two or more years. Those plans are already there. They're discussed openly in Washington. It's a crazy idea. It's, it, it's unfair to the people who put their money in there for all those years. But at a time of unemployment, what of course does it mean? Instead of people being a able to retire at 65 with a government pension they've counted on for 40 years, thereby opening that job to a young person or an unemployed person who needs it, we are now going to keep people in the labor force longer, which means our unemployment will last longer as well. Crazy, crazy stuff. But it's the stuff of a system that works this way. If we don't learn the lesson, and if we repeat again that we're going to regulate this system so it doesn't bite us in the rear end as regularly as it always has, then we haven't learned anything. This last time when the New Deal regulations were undone, we can say shame on those corporations for doing it. But if all we do in the face of this crisis is do it all again, then it's shame on us for not having learned the lesson that that wasn't enough. What is the positive lesson? 
We can't allow it to happen again. We cannot. We cannot allow this to continue, whether it's the damage to Mexico, the damage to Detroit, the da damage to young people who can't get a job, at least not one that they've been trained and educated to expect and to know how to do. But our commitment to a society and to a future is crucial here. What's the lesson that has to be learned? And here I have to push a little bit, even the boundaries of what you may be comfortable thinking about, but there really is no way out. If we're going to make an economic system that works for us, that does not periodically subject us to the kinds of crisis of the Great Depression, and remember how I began, I said we're in the fifth year, how long did the Great Depression last? 1929, 1941. That's a lot more than five years. And in case you think long depressions are only a thing of the distant past, uh-uh. In 1989, the second most important capitalist country collapsed into depression, Japan. And they're still in it. They never got out. The idea this is going to be a short one. Remember when this began in 2007 and 8? George Bush was president, saying, no problem, we'll be out of this quick, this is not, no problem. Early years of Obama, no problem, we'll have this solved, no problem. What? They don't even dare say that anymore, too many times. It didn't work. So what is it we have to do? What's the lesson? And here I have to say something that is particularly appropriate, because we're standing in front of the name over there, Arismendi Bakery. Arismendi, let's talk a little bit about that, that as the lesson. Arismendi was a Spanish priest in the north of Spain, right near the French border, the Pyrenees Mountains, Basque territory, the Basque people, suffering unbelievable unemployment. In the same period of time, the Great Depression, World War II. And he knew that he could not rely on the capitalist enterprise system, corporations, board of directors, shareholders, to provide work for his desperate people, so he took another step. Being a Catholic priest, he had a lot of authority in the Spanish culture and society, and he set up worker-directed, worker-run, worker-owned enterprises. Not working people dependent on a board of directors or shareholders. Working people using their own little savings, their own labor, to set up and operate their own businesses. Over 50 years ago. Today, the number of people who participate in what is there called the Mondragon system, founded by, I believe his name was Luis or Jose, I'm not sure, Arismendi, now numbers 100,000 workers. The most successful cooperative, collective enterprise system in modern history. It's worth something to think about. Not just because it's romantic or clever or sounds good. Those are all perfectly adequate reasons. But here's the one I want you to think about. If you don't want, if we don't want, this economic system to continue to impose these kinds of devastating long-term crises and remember the unemployed as every medical statistic shows when you have unemployed like this you are damaging not just the worker who loses his or her job but his or her spouse and his or her children and the impact on schooling and on mental health and on physical health and on alcoholism it's endless the costs of these crises they last for decades they make a mockery of the claim that this is an economic system that has anything to do with efficiency? You must be kidding. This isn't efficient. This is whatever the opposite of that is. So here's the lesson. You can't have reforms because the reforms get undone. Let's remember what a capitalist corporation is. It is run in this country, and in most countries, by something called a board of directors. 12 to 15 people, on average, who make all the basic decisions. What to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. And they're responsible to the people who put them in that job, the board of directors. And who are they? The major shareholders, not the shareholders as a whole, that's again your grandma with the 11 shares of something she left you. The major shareholders, we call them. 
And those, by the way, in most corporations are 15 to 20 other people. 15 to 20 major shareholders talking with the 15 to 20 people they put on the board of directors. They make all the decisions. For them, high taxes is a problem to be solved. For them, regulations impede the profitability of their enterprise, another problem to be solved. So here's what the boards of directors and the major shareholders do. They direct their underlings, their economists like me, their accountants, their lawyers, you know, to solve the problem. If there's a law that's hurting profits, evade it. If you can, amend it. And if you're really powerful, obliterate it, repeal it, get rid of it, like they did with the Glass-Steagall Act, like they did with high tax rates on corporations, like they did, et cetera, et cetera. If you leave them in the positions they were left in by the CIO, the socialists, and the communists, then they will undo whatever you've been able to win as fast as they know how. If all we do now is come up with some new regulations, the Dodd-Frank Act, or some new rules, or some new temporary taxes on rich people, you know, you really already know, you don't need me to know, that they have the wherewithal, as long as they run the businesses of this society, to take it away. The only difference will be over the next few years, they'll do it faster because they've had the last 50 years of practice and they've gotten really good at it. And you know that. They got smart. They didn't use Pinkertons and goons. Well, let me change that. They didn't use only Pinkertons and goons. They had the sophisticated forms, the think tanks to issue endless reports to fill the mailboxes of all the legislators with this or that rule. But most important, what the corporations knew was that they had the wealth in their hands and they could go to the political system and make sure it worked for them. They made sure it worked for them whether it's the think tank that changes the public's awareness of a problem, whether it's buying a particular politician or funding a particular party. If you've noticed over your lifetime that the difference between Republicans and Democrats is getting harder and harder to see, even if they wear different colored shirts, <laughs> it's because they are beholden to the same fundamental source. And let's be clear, if you're gonna undo the Great Depression's reforms, if you're gonna negate the New Deal, if you're gonna make a society of extreme wealth and poverty, if you're one of the rich 1%, you couldn't be so stupid as to imagine you can afford not to control the political system. If that's your strategy, if that's your goal, you better control the political system or else it isn't secure. So they did. If you're, going to, if you're going to change all of this then, it isn't enough to find occasionally the decent politician who says, I'm not gonna play that game. I'm not gonna subordinate myself to money. And it is very rare that I have the opportunity, but I'm gonna take it right now, to say that there is in this area, I've been taught, and I've been informed, and I'm glad to mention it, somebody who I believe is here. Uh, over there, and then Norman Solomon, who is, who is pledged not to take corporate donations, is pledged not to participate. That is an amazing and unspeakably rare phenomenon in our culture. And much as I am dubious, to say the least, about our two-party system and what they offer us, uh, when someone comes along who tries to change it from the inside, that person deserves the support that even those of us who are skeptical can give him. So I'm glad to, to say that on behalf of, of Norman. But the solution goes far beyond that, and I'm sure Norman would agree. The solution is, and here comes Arismendi, we cannot leave the business of the American economy in the hands of capitalist corporations. If we do, we will have this 
not just in the 1930s, not just in the beginning of this new century, we will bequeath the same risks and the same catastrophes to our children and our grandchildren. We have to learn the lesson. And the lesson is this. We have to go further than the CIO, the socialists, and the communists were able or willing to go in the 1930s. We cannot make changes and leave in place the institutions that will undo them because that's how they're organized. That's what they do. That's what they're paid to do. What do I mean? We have to ask finally with courage, and I think with enormous support that the American people will give to this. It's certainly been my experience as I talk all over the country about it. We have to bite the bullet. We have to say that the corporations of the United States are too important for the well-being of the mass of the people to continue to be held in the hands of a tiny group of people that not only clashes with the kind of economic well-being and security we need as a people, but it clashes with the most fundamental conception of democracy that exists. You know, as a nation, we're supposed to be advocates and enthusiasts for democracy. Democracy means that those who have to live with a decision must therefore participate in making it. We do not allow political decisions about our communities to be made by people who have no responsibility to us, who have to live with them. And yet, and yet, when you go to work every day, to your factory, to your office, to your store, you walk into a place in which the decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the fruits of your labor, are made by somebody else who has no responsibility to you in reaching those decisions whatsoever. If democracy is valuable, how in the world did we come to be in a society which doesn't make them valuable and applicable in the place we spend most of our adult lives? Five out of seven days, nine to five, you're at work. That's where your lifetime as an adult is mostly spent. If democracy is a value, it would have to apply there. By what rule was it excluded at the front door? And let me drive home in conclusion where this, where this leads. Imagine that the workers in the enterprises of America ran the businesses themselves. Here's how it might look. Monday to Thursday, you come to work like you always did, and you do your particular task, whatever that is. On Friday, you come to work like you always did, but you don't do your particular task. You sit around all day with all the other workers, and you debate, and you discuss, and you decide collectively, democratically, by vote, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. Here are some interesting things that might then happen. Let's see. Let's start with the following question. Should we close the factory and reopen in China? Mm, no, no, we're not going to do that because that's us. That's our job, that's our community, that's our school system, that's our, we're not going to do that. Here's another thought. In the United States, unlike most other capitalist countries, we pay, I shouldn't use we, they pay the top executives in these large corporations something that averages around 300 to 350 times the average salary of a worker in that enterprise. That's what it is. Most other capitalist countries don't do that, anywhere near that big, much smaller in places like Germany, Japan, and so on. Guess what wouldn't happen if the workers collectively ran their own enterprises? They wouldn't pay the executives, even if they had them, 300 times what the average worker, not even close. And guess what? That would be the single biggest blow to reducing the inequality of wealth and income in the United States that one could imagine. Because average people, whatever they might do in the way of paying some people a bit more than others for all kinds of reasons, are not going to do the obscenity that has become the norm in the United States. Here's another example. If a board of directors sitting in Chicago 
decides it's more profitable to use a toxic chemical in a factory here in California, they're free to do that. Do you think the same decision would be made if the workers in each enterprise made the decision themselves what technologies to use? I don't think so, because they have to breathe that. And their children who live nearby have to breathe that. And the community of which they're a part has to breathe it or use it as water, etc. So those of us that are concerned about ecological issues, here too is a basis for an alliance. It's democratic. It's more ecologically sensitive and friendly. It does a major, takes a major step in the direction of less inequality in wealth and income. How many more virtues do I have to list? This is a long overdue change in America. And if the workers themselves decided what to do with the profits, they wouldn't undo social welfare programs that were passed by the government in the manner of the Great New Deal. They would see those as valuable supports for what they want for themselves, their children, and their communities. It is long overdue that we question the traditional capitalist system. I don't want to shy away from what I'm suggesting because I'm I'm confident, and I wouldn't be so confident, and I didn't used to be so confident, but as I slowly moved in the direction of saying these things, instead of seeing audiences that got more and more uncomfortable, which is what I was used to, I found audiences that got more and more excited. Over the last 50 years, this country on the question of capitalism has been in hibernation. You know, over the last 50 years, we as a nation have taken a certain amount of pride, and I think it's deserved, that we question, for example, our educational system. Are our schools working? If not, they go to, we should debate this or that. We just came off a year and a half ago debating our national health system and our health delivery and insurance systems. And we debate our transportation system and we debate our water system. We debate the systems and institutions we live with and depend on. But here is now a taboo. For the last 50 years, you could not debate our economic system. To dare to do that was to be called dare I say it, <laughs> a red, a commie, or whatever. Everybody had to wave the flag. No debate, no discussion. Why? The economic system doesn't deserve dispute, debate, and change. It can't be improved. Come on, you know better. Everybody knows better. Finally, and this and in this, you have played already a major part. The Occupy movement is the first movement in 50 years to put the economic question right up front, right from the beginning. And that is an enormous contribution. In that way, you are ending a 50-year taboo in this culture. And because the capitalist system, the economic system, was protected behind the taboo of no criticism, it did what always happens to institutions that are not criticized. It rots. It falls apart. It disserves the people who live in it. So you're doing something for the American people, even those that are irritated by you. You are doing them an enormous service. You're taking an institution that isn't working, and you're saying it's up for debate. It can be questioned. It should be questioned. In any healthy society, it would have been questioned for all 50 years. But OK, that history is over. At the very least, we can start anew and begin by saying there's no reason, none, neither in their performance nor in its relationship to democracy, 
for an economic system to continue that locates all the basic decisions in a tiny group of unaccountable people. So let me conclude by urging you to stay with this movement that you are part of, that you helped to begin. Not to be distressed if the fickle media come and pay you a lot of attention for a while and then find something else to focus on. That's what it means when a media is not driven by the objective newsworthiness of a topic, but is driven by the same profit calculations that we have come to see as a problem in this society. The media are part of that. A little statistic for some of you might enjoy. In 1983, 90% of American media were controlled by 50 corporations, 50. Today, 90% of American media are controlled by six corporations, and you know their names, Viacom, Disney, and a few others. They control it all, and they are driven by the same profit mentality. They're making the same decisions on the same basis. That is the problem. We are grown-ups. Capitalism is not something handed down as part of the tablets Moses gave us. <laughs> Capitalism is a system that was born that flourished, and like every other system, it will die. The question is only how many of us it will take with us, with it, and we have the time, and at least so far in this society, we have the space, the political freedom still, to have meetings like this, and to allow folks like me to travel all across the country talking about this to audiences much larger than we've ever seen in the United States before. Occupy the United States, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy the Corporation are the watchwords that are developing on a new left in the United States. Not a new left that emerges from one particular corner of the society but something that comes organically out of a society that has reached a self-recognition of its problems. It's important you are pioneers of a new sort. Hang in there. Everybody will applaud sooner than you think. Thank you very much.